Welcome to Bible Prophecy Revealed with Grant Jeffrey. And it's a delight to be with you today. I'm speaking from the beautiful Holy Land experience here in Orlando, Florida. It is a wonderful place to bring your family. Next time you're in Florida, come and see the sites like the one behind me, a marvelously architecturally accurate model of what Jesus would have really seen walking around Jerusalem in the first century. I want to share with you tonight the topic of the coming one world government. The Bible tells us that in the last days, in the generation when Israel would be reborn as a nation, which occurred in 1948, that in that generation a number of prophecies would come to pass. But one of the most important next to the rebirth of Israel was that there would be a world government. Sometimes people ask, well, where is that prophecy actually found? Well, if we look in the prophet Daniel, one of my favorites, he speaks of it in a number of places, but one of the most clear is found in Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Now, Daniel's vision of the four beast, the fourth beast represented the Roman Empire, the greatest world government at that time within the known world, but it was not a global government. That Roman Empire was the largest empire and lasted for almost 1,500 years until the Eastern Roman Empire was finally destroyed in around 1453 A.D. What the Bible goes on to say is the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse or separate, different from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. What Daniel's talking about here is that unlike all the other empires that have passed, in the past history, we've seen even the British Empire, which in my day as a school, uh, going to high school, they had maps that would show one quarter of the entire globe in rose-colored paint that would indicate that the one quarter of the world was ruled by that little tiny island of England. But even that was not a global government. Daniel says the whole world will be represented by this fourth beast the fourth world kingdom. When we look at prophecy, we find also in Revelation. For example, in Revelation 13, we have a number of passages that refer clearly to this being a world government. Now, why is this important to understand? Well, any important point of prophecy, it's important that you and I understand where the Bible taught it. But also because there is a other interesting theory that's come up in the last two decades, really ever since the rise of radical Islam, and some people have suggested that the future Antichrist would actually be from the Islamic world. And they've also suggested that instead of a global government, that it would be a much more limited government, and it would be based basically around Israel and the Arab nations that surround Israel that basically went to war and had peace treaties with Israel back in the days of the Old Testament. I find this unconvincing. And here's why. We find in Revelation 13, verse 7, where John speaks of the Antichrist. He said it was given unto him to make war with the saints. This is the Antichrist and to overcome them. He's talking about the Antichrist is going to take war to the tribulation saints. He's going to overcome them. And then it goes on to say, and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now that is about as clear a statement as God could give us through his inspired prophet John that his kingdom, the Antichrist kingdom, is not going to be a regional superpower such as some have taught in the last few decades, but rather it is a true, unique, never before seen global government. The Bible goes on in Revelation 13, verse 12, speaking about the false prophet, who is the second beast. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. Now, the second beast is the false prophet. He exercised all the power of the first beast, the Antichrist, who goes before him. 
and he causes the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Here John is saying that everyone on earth is going to worship this Antichrist. Then in verse 14, and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Well, I think that's about as clear in four prophecy verses, four passages given by two of the greatest prophets in the Bible, dealing with the tribulation seven year period, that it's gonna be a global government and that every tribe, nation, kindred and tongue is gonna worship this antichrist during that period of time. When we look at global government, I think it's important for us to realize that we need to have an idea of how this would actually come about, what it would look like. I don't believe it is going to be sprung on the world in one moment. Rather, I believe that what we see happening in Europe since World War II, Europe has created the first regional super government that I believe is a blueprint, if you will, for the coming global government. Now, the European Union did not spring into a United States of Europe overnight. After World War I and the deaths of some 20 million people and World War II and the deaths of 60 million more, the nations of Europe were so afraid that with the new super weapons like atomic weapons now in the hands of the United States and shortly thereafter of Russia and then China, they realized that a nuclear war in Europe would be genocide. It would be the end of all mankind. And therefore they looked for a solution. And what they did is created the beginnings of a super government. They started with the Treaty of Rome in 1957. Started as a kind of an economic treaty, but it quickly grew into something more. Those who wanted world government wanted to start with one region that was motivated to go that way despite the fact that every study shows us that people love their country, love their history, love their flag and traditions, culture. But Europe had been so shocked by the deaths of so many millions in World War II and World War I, they were willing to try an experiment. With the Treaty of Rome, they gave a lot of economic power to a group that started out as six nations. Then it grew to 10 nations. Finally, it grew to 15 nations, and now it is 27. 27 nations that have come together, as the Bible prophesied, in other passages to create what I call the revived Roman Empire. The Bible said that fourth kingdom, the Roman Empire, would come back, and certainly the European Union is an example of it. This is a blueprint of coming world government. It started with the Treaty of Rome followed by the 1992 Maastricht Treaty, named for the town in Europe where they signed this treaty. And these nations gave their power to the center, gave their power to a group of 27, not elected, but rather appointed individuals. Most of them are virtually unknown to the European countries that appointed them. They tend to be former prime ministers. They tend to be chancellors of the exchequer. They tend to be parliamentarians that had a role, but maybe 10 years ago, and they're not in active political life. Following the Maastricht Treaty, which brought about the unification and the beginning of a true government in Europe, we've now gone through in 2009 the Lisbon Treaty. For several years, various nations, parliaments, and leaders voted to join the Lisbon Treaty that would create a much more regimented European Union government. But Ireland said no. And so they had a referendum. And Ireland said no. So they had a final one that took place a year, 2009. And what happened then was nothing less than if you keep having referendums, eventually someone's going to vote yes, and that's the end of the referendum process. So Europe finally got what it wanted, and Ireland voted to join. Now, what this did, it created a new type of real government. You have 27 appointed members, appointed each by the 27 member states of the Europe. But those 27 individuals, they make all their decisions behind locked doors as members of the Executive Commission of the European Union. The people back in Ireland, 
England, France, Italy. They don't get to vote on anything that matters. It's all done by these, usually ex-politicians, in secret, behind locked doors. Where's the power? The power's in the hands of 27 appointed people. Oh yes, you say, but isn't there a European Parliament? Yes, there is. But frankly, having studied the European Parliament, which meets in Strasbourg, whereas the Executive Commission meets in Brussels, Belgium, this Lisbon Treaty creates an even more regimented Executive Commission that runs everything in Europe. The European Parliament meeting in Strasbourg is voted on by the people of Ireland and England and France, etc. But guess what? They have no power whatsoever. It's like a high school debating society. They cannot set the taxes, they can't set the laws, and they can't choose the executives. Therefore, the power is really entirely in the hands of the executive commission. Now, when I talk about the coming one world government, I want you to understand that I am not suggesting that these people that truly think of themselves as global citizens, they want to have a global economy, they want to have a global military, one world army, they're not necessarily evil people at all. But having seen the disaster of World War I and World War II, knowing that we now have 200 nations, knowing that we now have weapons of mass destruction, not only nuclear, but biological and chemical, in this situation, they logically conclude that eventually one of the 200 nations is going to go to war and use weapons of mass destruction. They believe, therefore, the only logical way out is a global government in which there are no independent national sovereignties, no nations that can choose to send their army against another. Unfortunately, while I understand their thinking, it's incorrect. First of all, the Bible tells us that when the Antichrist achieves global government, and he will, that global government, when it's taken over by the Antichrist, becomes an oppressor to all the people of the world. But worse than that, that global government will have a rebellion where the Bible tells us in Revelation that the kings of the East, representing the Orient, will raise an army of 200 million men to march across Asia in an attempt to throw off the chains of the global Antichrist government. And that will set East against West in the most cataclysmic war in history, the Battle of Armageddon. Now, another reason why global government is coming there is a great deal of time and money and planning and people involved in a type of government strategy that is called continuity of government activities. For example, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States, has a budget of over $30 billion is now underneath Homeland Security. FEMA is part of Homeland Security now. But did you with many other people wonder why when the Katrina disaster took place in New Orleans that it was such a hodgepodge of disaster relief despite all the planning and all the people and all the billions that FEMA has as a budget every year. Well I looked into that and found to my shock and surprise that one of the problems is that by documentation 96 percent of the budget of FEMA actually goes to continuity of government planning, not to disaster relief. So they didn't have the money or the people or the training for what we thought was their basic purpose. What we have is a continuity of government plan. And that exists in America, Canada, Britain, Europe, all the nations have it. Why is that necessary? Well either due to a disaster like took place in Haiti with the earthquake on a larger scale to a nation like America or Canada or Britain. Obviously, governments have to plan how to respond to a threat which could be as bad as a weapon of mass destruction, a nuclear or a chemical or biological attack. When the president was inaugurated on January 20th, a lot of people noticed that there was one cabinet member who's very well known who was not in Washington that day. Here were all the Supreme Court justices, all the members of the cabinet, all the leaders of Congress in both houses. 
but there was one cabinet member who was not there. That was Robert Gates, the Secretary of Defense. He was in an underground base in Virginia, and he was designated to be the acting president of the United States had a disaster taken out the government. In a world of terrorism, when we know al-Qaeda is attempting to acquire weapons of mass destruction, it is irresponsible for governments not to plan to be able to continue the nation's life and control of its military regardless of what happens, even the loss of your capital and most of the government. And now, what happens? Well, governments knowing this have planned. Many former members who led departments in the government were former cabinet members, former military officers, exist in underground bases in the United States and in Canada and Europe as well. They're ready at a moment's notice, if the very worst happened, to take over the government and control the military, disaster relief, etc. It's essential that they do so. It would be irresponsible if they did not. This creates a kind of shadow government situation which is essential in a world of weapons of mass destruction and even international disasters. But you see the problem. If you have the tools of government ready to step in at a moment's notice to carry on without a Congress, without even a president, if the government has been lost, then those tools could easily be used in a difficult situation of a disaster to replace democratic government. For example, the threat of Islamic terrorism, together with the situation we have today with information warfare taking place where, for example, China and Iran each have armies of computer hackers that have broken into the opposite government's computer systems and tried to take them down. This is going on all the time with North Korean and Chinese hackers trying to break in to America and Canada's internet systems to break down our economy, our military communications. We live in a dangerous world, and so these governments have created a continuity of government program in each case, but that could easily be used in a future dictator to literally take over at a moment's notice in an emergency, whether real or imagined. Now, there are groups that have been planning world government since World War II. One of the most famous, though the least known, is called the Bilderberger after the Bilderberger Hotel, where in 1954 they met in Europe. Here are a hundred plus of the wealthiest and most powerful people on earth, and these people want world government. They're so secret that no one is allowed to come without an invitation, and only very important politicians and media people are invited. But you know what? Those people that come have to take an oath. It's called Chatham House Rules based on Chatham House in England that for a hundred years has been planning world government. It means that whatever is spoken and whoever spoke it can never be referred to outside the meeting. And David Rockefeller, who is member of the global group, who wants global government, once thanked the head of the New York Times and Washington Post. For though they had been invited to these meetings, they never once wrote about it. How often have you seen an article about the Council of Foreign Relations? The Council of Foreign Relations is a, an American organization founded in around 1921 after World War I. And its plan was to move America into a global government, starting with the League of Nations, which, as you know, the Senate said no to, and finally into World War II and the disaster that took place. And then, even before the end of World War II, They've planned the United Nations, and it was primarily members of the Council of Foreign Relations. These are Americans, about 3,200 plus of them. These people have joined this organization because they believe America has to lose its sovereignty in order to take over and become part of global government. They believe that if America doesn't become part of global government, then global government would be meaningless, and they're right. But America is way too powerful, way too powerful economically, militarily, and even politically to fit easily into global government. So what's their plan? Their plan is to reduce America's military 
its economy, and its political power. And only then, when America is weakened, such as Europe and especially England was after World War II, would America be able to fit into world government. You need an army if you have a world government, and NATO, in fact, is going to be and is already becoming the army of the global government. How do we know that? Well, you know, for 50 years, NATO was the most successful defensive alliance in history, held back the Soviet Union and its massive multiple million armies. And what did we find? That in 1999, we saw a situation where NATO got together at the Washington Con Conference, and what did they decide? To change the Treaty of NATO that had been so successful for 50 years that any attack on a member of NATO would be an attack on every member of NATO. And it worked, and it stopped war from occurring in Europe. But in 1999 at the Washington Conference, they changed the treaty to say that any area from Morocco in North Africa all the way to the Ganges River in India would henceforth be an area of concern for NATO. Instead of just being North Atlantic Treaty, it would be involved that whole volatile area of North Africa, the Middle East, all the way into Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and all the way to India. Why is NATO with 28 nations in Afghanistan? NATO. Because NATO made a decision that any danger to NATO members, even though there was not an invasion of a member, would be deemed as a reason for NATO to apply its military and intelligence abilities to fight drug lords, countries that were trying to develop weapons of mass destruction like Iran, as well as fighting radical Islamic terrorists like Al-Qaeda, the Taliban. So we're in a situation now where the army of the world government that is quickly coming to pass is in fact an army that already exists and has tremendous military capabilities far beyond any other conceivable opponent in the world. Next, we're told that in the last days, and I'll have a special program that deals with this in the future, that the governments that won World War II got together and formed the Project Echelon intelligence system that would sur have surveillance of telephone calls, faxes, emails, internet, of all communications by every one of over six and a half billion people throughout the world. Everything would be listened to, recorded on hard drives, and analyzed by very sophisticated computers. The internet now is wide open, and when you are on an email, when you are internet surfing, please act as if someone's standing over your shoulder. Because if you ever become of interest to a future government that wants to see, perhaps your son applies for a high-level security position, or your daughter wants to join the military, then they go back and check all family and friends for anything that might be suspicious or of concern. Revelation 13, 16 to 18, tells us that in the last days, this Antichrist, this global governor, who's going to be a dictator to take over, first of all, the 10 nations of a unified Europe, together with then using war and peace treaties, the entire planet. We're told that he is going to have a surveillance system such as we have never seen before. A surveillance system that will literally be able to stop anyone from working or buying or selling unless they give their allegiance and worship him as God. Never in history has there been a system such as the Project Echelon system or the kind of technology I'm going to talk about in a future program, radio frequency ID chips that are so small they're the size of a period at the end of a sentence, so small that they're virtually invisible, and so small that they're in billions of products, consumer products, that you and I use, and no one ever talked to you about it. No parliament or Congress ever voted about this. They have not even discussed it. The result is, there is now a surveillance system in place globally. The United States and Canada are part of it. 
Europe is part of it, together with Australia and New Zealand. But in addition to that, these radio frequency ID chips by the billions are now being used around the world that allow you to be de detected as an individual and identified from up to 100 feet away. I'll be talking about this. What does it all mean? I'm not here to fill you with doom and gloom. I am not. I do believe we as concerned citizens and Christians need to be aware of what is happening in our day. That we can become concerned citizens and exercise our political rights to contact our senators and congressmen or parliamentarians and tell them that you're concerned about the direction that America is going toward world government. And as a result, politicians have one good job, and that is to get reelected. They're very interested in what their constituents think. When you write a letter, they do pay attention. We are living in the last days. The Bible says the Antichrist is going to have a totalitarian, total population control police state. Never in history, my friend, has this been technologically possible. But as you will see in these programs, the research that I've done shows we're very, very close. Now, the promise of God to the church is that he's going to take us home to glory before the Antichrist consolidates his global political and military power by making a seven-year treaty with Israel before the mark of the beast is ever introduced. What then should we do? Jesus said, Luke 21, 28, speaking of these kind of prophecies, when these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws nigh. It's not doom and gloom, my friend. It's a message of hope. Jesus Christ is coming soon.